Hebrews chapter 10. I've explained verse 32 through 37 that recall the tribulation Jew, what he is supposed to do for other people. So here's another person. Regarding how they're supposed to treat them, they're supposed to treat them in love. They're supposed to uh, look out for them. They're supposed to feed them, clothe them, take good care of them. And these others are known as the poor. Now, why are these people known to be the poor? Because during the tribulation timeline, if you're not going to join the Mark of the Beast program, how are you going to buy? How are you going to sell? How are you going to make a living? How are you going to eat? So because of that, these poor people are genuinely equated with the good guys or with the saints. So remember that. The poor people are generally equated with the saints. We saw that at the book of James, chapter 5. We also saw that in Matthew, chapter 25, which uh, we're not going to turn over there again. I'm just getting you to catch up. So remember, this whole passage we're examining is tribulation Jews where they have to make sure they treat the poor saints well. This also includes the ministers. The poor saints are not, uh, the poor is not just the saints. These are also the ministers. Because they're giving the gospel, they're preaching. So it is their job that they're supposed to treat them well. And ministers are obviously not very rich people, okay? So generally they're not. They have to uh, sacrifice what they can to keep spiritually feeding God's people. But during the tribulation timeline, that's especially a given that the ministers are not rich. <laughs> they are poor. They probably, get su they probably suffer the most because the government or the one world government is going to hound them. They want to kill them. They want to kill the minister, kill the minister's family. We have saw in Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ mentioned about enduring to the end for salvation, which is a tribulation context, but then he also mentioned within that co tribulation context <clears throat> that people who were to feed or who were to bless a minister, basically the phrase is give a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, then Jesus Christ mentioned that they will be rewarded for that. So that's what we understood so far regarding tribulation saints. And they're supposed to do this how long? Just a little while. <laughs> now, I know that we're laughing and we're thinking, well, this ain't a little while. It's been about more than 2,000 years. But remember this, if that church age, which is almost 2,000 years, if that bracket didn't exist, it would have been a little while. It's just what? A couple a couple years during the first centuries, and then seven-year tribulation. That's it. Remember that bracket of church age, which is almost 2,000 years long, was only inserted because those Hebrews rejected their Messiah. If they didn't, though, if they accept him, then these Hebrews, it would have been just a little while longer just holding out, just holding out, ministering to each other, especially when the Antichrist and the one world government starts to reign supreme, taking care of God's ministers, and then the problem would have been solved. So Jesus Christ, in His coming, Second Advent or Second Coming, they're anticipating any moment, and it's only just a little while longer. We saw that at James chapter 5, correct? At James chapter 5, we've seen that here the poor are getting persecuted, so they're trying to help out the poor. And God says, be patient, therefore, just a little while unto the coming of the Lord. Now, what, another passage which is interesting is John 16. Go to John 16. 
A lot of people, when we look at when they look at this passage, they think that this is referring to the ascension of Jesus Christ. But this is not referring to the ascension of Jesus Christ. This is actually, believe it or not, tied to the book of Hebrews, where Jesus Christ, when he said, a little while and I'll come back, he's talking about that second coming. So he's telling those disciples about a tribulation reference that I will return again meaning his second coming. So in the meantime, you're just going to undergo sorrow. That sorrow is actually the tribulation. That sorrow is actually the tribulation. So I'm going to write out the time period here so that people don't get lost. But this timeline is tribulation. And then the other side of the picture, you'll notice church age. And that's the reason why you'll notice that I had 666 over here, and then you'll notice that I had a church building here. That way people can see, have visual aid and understand what's going on. Church age. Now look at John chapter 16, and then notice what Jesus says to his disciples. And then you'll understand why people thought that this is referring to his ascension. <clears throat> he says in verse 16, 16, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Now notice from this verse what's a lot of Christians could assume. A lot of Christians can assume what this means then is that Jesus is telling his disciples before he died on the cross, hey, there's going to be a little while you're not going to see me. Why? Because he, he dies, so he's not with them. But then it says right here, again, a little while and you're going to see me. But he assures them they're going to see him again. Why is that? Because during the meantime, he's going to be going to his father up in heaven. If you know the story, Jesus Christ died. They didn't see him. He raised from the dead. And then when he raised himself from the dead, a few saw him. But then he had to ascend to the Father. So he ascended to the Father and then went back down on the earth and then showed himself and appeared to the disciples again. So a lot of people assume that John chapter 16, verse 16, this, I mean, it does really fit well. It fits well with that part of the story, Jesus' ascension. But like I told you, this is tribulation, and I'll tell you why. The reason why, look at verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Yes, I inquire. Will you please answer it, Lord? <laughs> verily, verily, I say unto you, He gives a clue here, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Now we would assume from that, well, yeah, the disciples, they are undergoing sorrow because Jesus died. But then just a little while and then Jesus Christ will show his resurrection to them and they will be happy, right? So that's what we'll naturally assume. So we think this is part of, again, the ascension story of Jesus Christ. But I want to emphasize again, no. And the reason why is Jesus already gave you the answer. He mentions right here, first of all, notice several things here. Several things where we can find out about this little while is that, uh, you always lose room, Gene, you always lose room, so, <laughs> okay. In this little while, there are several things to note. One is, the world will rejoice. You see that? I don't think the whole Roman Empire was rejoicing when Jesus died on the cross. Not all of them knew about that, obviously. So the clue here is that this is a world. Now, 
Number two, notice he said that you will have sorrow, travail, right? The third one, he says that this sorrow and travail that you're going to undergo is going to be similar to what a pregnant woman goes through. So a pregnant woman goes through this sorrow, but then from a pregnant woman stage, then finally gives birth to a child. He gave you the big clues already. You know what that is? What that is, the world is rejoicing, the whole one world government is rejoicing against the sorrow of Jesus' disciples, those Jewish disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, a.k.a. tribulation saints. So they are rejoicing over them as they're undergoing the sorrow. In the Bible, tribulation, see that word? is the same thing as what? Sorrow and travail. So Jesus Christ told you it's a time period of travail, time period of sorrow, also known as a time period of tribulation. That's same wording. These are same wordings right here. The third one, which is the most convincing, is the pregnancy and the birth. So go to Isaiah 54, all right? That is the most convincing evidence. So go to Isaiah 54. All right, Isaiah chapter 54, and then we're going to turn to Isaiah uh, 56 eventually. I mean, not 56, 66, all right? So if you're able to turn over there as well, go to Isaiah 66 as well. Now, notice that God said in these two passages, he prophesied to them. He prophesied to the nation of Israel, not the church. Church is not mentioned here. He prophesied to the nation of Israel that they would undergo a sorrowful time period. And when you look in the future, they will. So obviously, that is a tribulation timeline. One day, the whole world will attack them in the future, and they're going to undergo a sorrowful time. Why? That's plainly tribulation then. And then he says that this sorrow is going to be likened to a woman who's going through pregnancy. But one day when you become restored, the nation of Israel restored, the Bible says God likened it to a pregnant woman who gave birth. See that? So this sorrow and birth has to do with millennium and tribulation. A lot of you don't realize this, but the illustration God used for the two dispensations, tribulation and millennium, is a pregnant woman giving birth. That could tie, which I'm not going to go on la-la land here, all right? I know that sometimes you like that, but I'm not going to do that. But uh, there's a reason why in Genesis 3, God put the curse upon the woman as sorrow through pregnancy, but giving birth. And then he gave the promise about the Messiah coming. It all ties to what? The Messiah who reigns in the millennial kingdom after mankind undergoes that sorrowful time. But anyway, 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 but that's a whole nother study, all right? We'll go to Isaiah chapter 54. Look at verse 1. He's speaking to Israel. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Bring forth, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation, spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles." and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. There is no doubt that's tribulation, millennial reference there. And we see that the nation of Israel is likened to that woman who gives birth to a child. All right, let's go to Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66. You also notice the words travail and sorrow, sorrow are also mentioned. So what is Jesus saying then at John 16? Why does he use those wordings? What do you think he had in mind? Obviously, he knew about Isaiah 54. That was on his mind when he said that. But also Isaiah 66. 
Isaiah 66. Notice right here, the Bible says, 6, verse 6, a voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth what? Recompense to his enemies. Remember our previous Hebrew study? What is the vengeance of the Lord? What is the recompense of the Lord? Do you remember? That's his what? Second coming. Did you forget that? That is his, that's day of vengeance. That's day of recompense. I'm not going to do that again, but you, you knew that from before, okay? So the second coming, remember, is his recompense or vengeance. Now, we see then this is second coming again. This is tribulation context. Again, go to the next verse. Before she travailed. See that? She brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? See, this is not about the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Restoration, rebirth. See that? Regeneration. For as soon as Zion travailed, see Israel, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Uh, rejoice ye with Jerusalem, be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her. So notice right here, uh, in verse 12, verse 12, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. That's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah. That's where the idea comes from. We're not praying for world peace or no more war in Israel during, with that Palestinian conflict. That's not the idea. When we're praying for the peace of Jerusalem, we're praying Jesus Christ comes down and sets up his kingdom. Keep reading. And the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream, then shall ye suck. Ye shall be born upon her sides and be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Look at that. So notice that they uh, glean the rewards from the Gentiles. That is what Hebrews was talking about. Hebrews was talking about the world persecuting, excuse me, right here, the world persecuting those Jews, right? Jesus talked about the world persecuting those Jews. What, who's the world? Gentile nations, obviously. Non-Jewish nations, that's what world means. So non-Jewish uh, nations, Gentiles, notice that they're the bad guys and then the Jews are the good guys. That's why you, what you're seeing right now is there is no doubt, hands down, United Nations, the ideal representation of Gentile nations, they're the bad guys. So that's why we don't believe in globalists. That's why we do have an antagonism. We do have a suspicion. Yes, we believe in those theories that there's evil going on amongst globalists. Mm -hmm. Yes, th that's, those are true factual statements because the Bible points out it will happen. And it's building up to that. Now... Uh, we go back to Hebrews 10. We go back to Hebrews 10. So we know that verses, let me sum it up again, verse 32 through 37, that taking care of the poor, taking care of God's ministers, that's what God wants during the tribulation. And they are to be patiently waiting for the Lord in the meantime while they're undergoing that because it's only a little while. Now that's tribulation application. Now remember, I said you can also make church age applications as certain verses in Hebrews. And believe it or not, you can make church age application here. Because the common sense is, if you were to read verse 32 through 37, anybody who, are to, who, who, were, uh, who, who is to read that passage can apply it to himself or herself. Notice the idea of verse 32 through 37. Again, all right, which I won't read because we read it before, but you go ahead and read it, is that Christian saints are also undergoing persecution. Christian saints are also undergoing suffering from the lost world here. So it is our job 
to support each other. Our job is to support one another, especially God's ministers here. When you minister to God's minister, then the Bible says in these passages you gain a reward. That's why Hebrews says don't cast off your reward. Now the only part you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to see is in verse 35 that the confidence of great reward is going to be your inheritance rather than your salvation, right? So that's the lenses that you're going to have to see if you want to apply that verse to yourself. So a church age Christian can apply this passage 32 through 37 through those lenses. But then what about a little while, right? Because 2,000 years is not a little while. That is not a little while. As a matter of fact, you can claim that passage too, that it's only a little while that we're undergoing. So just be patient. Just keep serving God. Just keep working for Him. Just uh, make sure you take care of God's ministers, and He will reward you. Aren't there preachers and Christians who preach like that today? So then what do we think about just a little longer, a little while? Because the rapture's coming soon, so it won't be long now, so just keep holding on. Well, to be honest, it's 2,000 years, so why do you keep saying it'll be soon, it'll be soon? So let's look at the passages here, all right? So first of all, uh, let's look, we're going to look at four passages. Let's start off with uh, Romans 8 and 2 Corinthians 4. Romans 8. And 2 Corinthians 4. Notice that these references match perfectly with the book of Hebrews, which shows that they must have had the same author. So Paul must have wrote the book of Hebrews because a lot of the ideas in the book of Hebrews match, it, match up with what he wrote to New Testament church Christians. Let's start off with uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, notice how it matches with Hebrews concerning the reward, right? Verse 17, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. See that? But notice that this reward is tied to suffering. Same thing like Hebrews 10 told you. When you're undergoing suffering, you're going to get rewarded. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. See that? Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to, compared, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. See that? So Paul is urging Christian saints that even though you're undergoing suffering, you will get rewarded for it. So we can, in a sense, say in Hebrews 10, cast not away your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. So we can put it in that sense. But don't forget the tribulation application. We know what confidence is referring to. That one is referring to actually salvation. So you have to be wary of that. But anyways, when we look at verse 19, notice the very next verse is what? Rapture. Very next verse, second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes for them. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now notice right here, see the sorrow and travail? That can go along well with John 16. So our sorrow and our travail is currently right now, obviously. So if you're going to stay comfortable in this world, you're in the wrong lifestyle, Christian. In verse 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the what? Redemption of our body. See that? So that's the rapture. So this matches well with Hebrews 10. Now look at verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with what? Patience wait for it. That matches with Hebrews about just be patient, wait a little longer. Wait. Why? Because he's coming. Jesus is coming. That matches perfectly well with that. Now obviously the common sense to you and me is it's not a little while. It's 2,000 years. 
But go to 2 Corinthians 4. Paul gives you the answer right here uh, on this little while. All right? Go to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, notice that this is matching the same idea with Romans 8. It matches the same idea with Romans 8 and Hebrews 10. The Bible says in verse 8, verse 8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. See how that matches with Hebrews 10 and Romans 8? We undergo suffering. The world persecutes us makes fun of us, criticizes us. So this matches very well, but notice that in verse 16, 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So even though outwardly our flesh feels the pain and everything, it's doing something good spiritually. Now look at verse 17. This is a key. For our light affliction... Which is what? For a but for a moment, he calls it. Work it for us. Why is it only a little while? Why is it only a moment? Because you compare it to eternity. Yeah. Work it for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, that reward is all eternity. So when you enter eternity, do you realize then that 2,000 years is like a very little time to you? When you reach all eternity and lose track of time and then uh, all you sense and feel and your brain is built upon that clock of eternity, 2,000 years is a very, very short time. It's a blink of an eye to you. That's what you've got to understand. So that's why we can say a little while. Because the reason why is in spite of 2,000 years of church history, 2,000 years... Look how much smaller it is compared to what? Eternity. It's like this. So small. It can't compare to eternity, which encompasses endless time here. Uh, eternity or 2000? All right, all right, then, so, la, la, la. Let's get rid of that part, all right. Okay? No, it's down. Uh, all right, it doesn't matter, fine. <laughs> okay, it's gone, it's gone. All right, so in eternity, it just pales so much in comparison. It pales so much in, uh, 2,000 year pales so much in comparison, which is why it can be considered to be a little while. So in the meantime, as we're undergoing travail and sorrow and persecution from the lost world, we're going to keep serving God the best way that we can, and we don't want to lose our reward, right? So don't lose your reward. Hang on to it. Just keep serving God. People who settle down with the world, then you are picturing the same thing that those tribulation saints do. When tribulation saints settle down with the world, who are you settling down with? Listen, the Antichrist doesn't have to officially come out and officially come out with this one world government. We already see his spirit at work here. There is a one world government already going on. There is already an Antichrist going on. Throughout history, we had many candidates of that. But that's behind, that, those are unofficial versions. Those are, in the, those are what's happening spiritually. So how many Christians have compromised and taken 666 with the world? See that? Now, you're, you're fortunate you're in the church age. If you're in the tribulation, it would have costed your soul for all eternity. So it is ludicrous that Christians think that tribulation salvation is the same as Christian church age. <laughs> it is also even more ludicrous that they say, if you're really saved by faith, you're not going to take the mark of the beast. That's hilarious because spiritually right now, we've seen too many Christians already doing that. See, so they think that, oh, no, it would, safe Christians will never take the mark of these. They won't do that. Never, ever, never. No, they already compromised so much with the world already. Might as well go all the way with the rest. If you're going to starve to death and you got babies to feed. I mean, if people are not serving God in church already or separating from the world because of what? Because of what? A lower pay and salary? 
Because of what? My house condition is not as comfortable. Because of what? These petty things, these are what Christians whine and complain about in their reason to not separate from the world and serve God. Man, they would be slaughtered in the tribulation then. Absolutely slaughtered. All right, so let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We Christians have been very, very blinded by a Laodicean worldly mentality. We got to wake up out of that. Remember, we are truly not of this world. What do you think Jesus meant by that? We're not of this world. But the thing is, you think that you have to wake up and open your eyes that, oh, we're not of the world system and, uh, when, it, when it comes to tribulation, when it comes to Antichrist, right? So once you see the Antichrist, once you actually see the one world government, once you actually see 666, then it's like you're thinking that, oh, I can't be of the world. What have you been doing all that time? What have you been doing all that time? We Christians need to repent and get right with God. I hate to say this, but let me say this part, all right? Do you know why conspiracy theorists seem to be better in worldly separation than you com comfortable Christians? Seem to be doing more than you comfortable Christians? Because they think they're undergoing the tribulation. Because they think they're seeing the Antichrist. And they think that this current one world government is the one world government of the Antichrist right now. That's why they're doing more than what you Christians are doing while you're sailing down with the world and getting comfortable. You might as well uh, smell the coffee a little bit and then see that we are undergoing spiritually an Antichrist, wicked, satanic government, and I refuse to be a part of it. I want to be separate from it. I want to attack it. I want to attack it. That's why, how do you attack it? Not through fleshly carnal means, like a lot of these conspiracy theorists make the mistake of doing. It's by spiritual means. Well, you, have to, you can't bring the perfect kingdom on, on the earth. You can't change your government. It's going to become the Antichrist government. How you're going to fight it out is get some souls saved from hell. Get some people to get delivered from the worldly system by getting into a Bible-believing church. Get them to serve Jesus Christ so that they can join you in gaining that reward for glory. All right, blah, 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 blah. All right, 2 Corinthians 9, all right. 2 Corinthians, that, that was a good sermon there. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Yeah. Now, Paul is writing to New Testament church Christians, and he points out that this poverty that ministers go through and that Christians undergo, that there should still be a giving going on. So it just matches, per and you will be blessed by the Lord for it. So it matches perfectly well with Hebrews chapter 10 that God will bless you if you are to uh, support and then uh, help out God's ministers. Notice that 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the Bible says in verse 10, Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown. So here it is, you are ministering. So ministering means to serve. It means to help out. That's the idea. Kind of like um, financially support, whatever. The idea is you're helping out and God words it as seed. And you're giving it to the sower. Now obviously we know who the sower is. The sower is the one who's ministering bread for your food. Is your pastor feeding you? Is your sower feeding you? Is your minister feeding you? So that's why you feed them. So that's why you take care of them. And because of that, what God will do at the next part of verse 10, multiply your seed sown. So he's going to bless it, that means. He's going to increase out of that. The verse says, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. See, so the Lord's going to bless you if you take care of God's ministers. Now let's go to Matthew 10. So here's the encouraging part. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Believe it or not, when you give that little money in the church, you get a reward in heaven. A lot of people don't realize that. Yes, you get rewarded in heaven. Wow, really, pastor? Yeah, if you just go over to one of God's ministers 
it's going to be the same operation like a tribulation because ministers undergo a demonic attacks, right? From that spiritual antichrist, from the devil, from the world. So then, as Hebrews 10 argued, if you aid those ministers who are suffering such persecution and, and attacks, then God will bless you for it and you will get a reward for it. So Matthew 10 is very encouraging if you feel like you're not going to get anything at the judgment seat of Christ. Matthew 10, <clears throat> verse 41. Now remember, we saw that in this passage, this is a tribulation reference. But don't a lot of Christians use this passage as well? I mean, if the same operation works in the tribulation with the suffering and reward system, why not a saved Christian as well? Especially since they all have the same author, Paul, who wrote the idea, right? So look at verse 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a what? Prophet's reward. Oh, Pastor Kim, you're going to have a lot of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, whereas me, I, I don't have it. I, you know, that's very kind of people to say that about me, but it kind of makes me sick and tired because it makes me feel like I'm going to get more than you. You know, it would be, <laughs> what if I get less than you? You said, no, Pastor, yeah, what if I get less than you? I really believe that. I might get less than some of you, all right? And I don't want you to just get disappointed with me at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm just going to feel so awful, you know? So the thing is, is that, believe it or not, according to this verse, people, even though they're not a minister, all right? They're not a prophet. They're not a preacher. They can get a prophet's reward. Why? By receiving the prophet in the name of a prophet. Eh, ain't that a blessing? Ain't that a blessing? Now keep reading. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's re reward. So here's your saint, right? So taking care of the saint as well as taking care of the minister. Verse 42, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of what? Cold water, only in the name of a disciple. That's all it is. Pastor, Here's water for you when you preach. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. How many of you are encouraged after that? How, I, how many of you are going to give me a whole stack of water bottles after this message, right? <laughs> All right, go back. Go back. Isn't that encouraging? A lot of things, uh, here's the thing. You very much uh, underestimate the little things you do for God. God keeps track of every little thing you do and makes sure to reward you richly for even the little things. Now, can you imagine it, when you serve God well, how much more he's going to reward you? See, it ain't worth the world. It ain't worth the world. Even with capitalism trying to make things fair, it's not fair, as you know. Why people waste time on that, right? You're waste. You are wasting very good time. Now, this is a lot of good preaching here at Hebrews 10. We've learned two good convicting sermons right here. Is that one, you can be very encouraged on how much you're going to get rewarded and blessed by God. So why waste your time trying to get rewarded by the world who don't even pay you fairly? And then two, why even join the world when that is a wicked antichrist, satanic 666, hell on earth that we should never be a part of. So these are two good things that we can learn as Christians. So whatever suffering we undergo or persecution or unfairness, it just comes with the baggage and it's worth it. It just comes with the baggage, it's worth it. And just endure it a little longer. That's what you have to keep telling yourself. Just a little bit, just endure a little bit. Just keep pushing a little bit. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Lots of good stuff here that we learned. Lots of good stuff here that we learned. Now, when we go to verse 38, here's a famous passage. Now, the just shall live by faith. Yeah, amen. Yeah, so we like that verse. Compare that with Romans 1. Romans 1. Romans 1. So Hebrews 10, 38 says, now the just shall live by faith. So that should be very plain who the author is, right? <laughs> if we go to Romans chapter 1 and then verse 17, same author, Paul, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God 
reveal from faith to faith. See that? No works, right? It's faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, that's wonderful, right? Now, notice in Romans, Paul never said that you could lose it, right? It points out right here, uh, you gain God's righteousness, and it goes from faith to faith. See that? So it's through and through. It's permanent. But then when you go back to Hebrews 10, all right, verse 38, <clears throat> Now the just shall live by faith. Amen. Bless God. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Oops. All right. Meaning. All right. So I'll explain each and every word. So the just, they live by faith. That's how you and I are going to live. How we receive uh, justness is by faith. How we receive a just life is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Romans 1.17. But in Hebrews, the author is saying, if you draw back, all right, so if you backslide away from this faith, then God's soul is not going to be pleased with him. Now, notice right here, he puts context of soul here. So it's as if your soul is at stake. But even more scary is verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. So the author says right here that... Me, on the other hand, and those of you who are going to join me, I'm not going to be one of those who backslide, who draws back to hell. That's perdition. Perdition means hell. I'm of those, we are of those, the Bible says in the last part of verse 39, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So instead, we are the ones who believe and trusted in God for salvation that he, that he would save our soul. So this belief and this faith, you'll notice right here, is something that they have to keep. So tribulation saints have to keep the faith. So you'll notice right here that this keeping of faith, they have to hold on to it. They have to go toward this direction. But if you don't keep going toward this direction and you go in this direction, what is that? That's backsliding. See that? So that's getting out of the faith. Why? Because you choose to endorse the Antichrist and then you burn in hell for all eternity. So tribulation science, it's so obvious, okay? Even Christians realize this too, okay? It's just so obvious, okay? Christians would even agree that if you're going to be a, a saved believer during the time of the tribulation, a saved believer would not side with the Antichrist. Isn't that just common sense? All right. So even Christians realize that you have to hold on to your Christian faith and don't get out of that. Now, how many Christians today are doing that? See that? So it's just common sense. There's different salvations going on here. Tribulation is not the same as church age. There are so many Christians getting out of their faith and backsliding out of their faith, but then here in the tribulation, they, if they backslide, if they get out of that, then they burn in hell because uh, what they've done, when you get out of that faith, that means you join the world. You've joined the Antichrist system. So it's extremely dangerous during the time of the tribulation. You can cost your soul. You can lose your soul at that time. So this just shall live by faith, yes, but once you have that faith, you're supposed to keep it. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Whereas Romans 1.17, there is no mention about that. No mention about you keeping it. It's as if faith keeps you. It says God's righteousness that we've attained. And then it goes from faith to faith. See that? So it's, it's as if faith has kept us. See that? So for the church age Christian, it's... It's as if the faith has kept us. Okay. So we see the differences of church age salvation as well as tribulation salvation. Verse 38 through 39 should be utmost proof of tribulation salvation here, actually. This is not faith alone for salvation. All right. This has to do with working. This has to do with keeping your faith. This is not one saved, always saved. 38 through 39 is utmost proof that there's a different, uh, there's a faith and work system going on. Absolute, no doubt about it. 
People who say, oh, no, that's just blasphemy. How dare you say that? Well, well, that's what the verse says. And even you would agree if the tribulation were to happen and the Antichrist were to happen, if you got out your Christian faith, if Christians were to go through it, then you burn in hell for all eternity. So even those people who believe differently will have to agree with what I stated there. All right, go to chapter 11. <clears throat> chapter 11 and verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We begin the most famous chapter on faith. And this is probably a chapter that uh, Christians should memorize. Lots of good stuff you can learn from this one. So God starts out defining faith here. All right? Because, remember, these tribulation Jews, they have to hold on to their faith at verse 38, 39, right? So chapter 11, God's going to encourage them about their faith. And Christians can actually, even though they're not going to lose their salvation, even though doctrinally it doesn't apply to them, they can devotionally learn something here, right, about faith, what they've got, what they have to do, what they can learn from. Faith, we must understand, is a substance. So it is something tangible. See, it's something tangible. Of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, everything that we've hoped upon, in other words, we, uh, that hope is something you expect to happen, something you expect to happen, you anticipate. All these things that you have hope upon, those make up the substance. It is something tangible. So, in other words, we have faith in Jesus Christ, right? We have uh, faith that we're going to have a heavenly inheritance. We have faith that we're going to go to heaven. We have faith in a rapture. All these things are actual things. Actual things. Tang tangible and real. So these real things is what makes up that substance of our faith. That's why faith is a substance. Because it's not by itself, it's because of those things that we hope for. So that's what makes up our faith. A lot of scientists, they'll try to say that faith is something that is, has no substance, right? They try to make faith as something that's uh, invisible, it's fantastical, it's uh, not real. But faith, we see that it is a tangible object. God says otherwise. Faith is tangible. It is real. If you were to even look at that uh, evolutionist, that evolutionist, his belief is tangible. His faith, see that? He has faith. That is tangible. Why is that? Because he has the elements there that he's studying in our physical universe, right? So these elements, these things that he hopes for, that he anticipates, that scientists anticipate and predict through their experiments, that's what causes them to what? Believe, have faith. See that? So even if we were to ignore Christianity, right? The Christian meaning, the point is faith is something tangible because of the things that you hope for. That's important to understand. Faith is tangible and it is evidence too. So we've, we've described two things about faith that a lot of scientists or evolutionists and atheists have never thought about that they won't tell you. It's tangible and it has evidence. So go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. 1 Peter. I also want to add a third thing. A third thing is it is rational. It is rational. It is aligned with reason. Reason. So faith has evidence. Strong evidence. Proof. Scientists don't believe that any proof or evidence exists unless it's something you can feel, taste, touch, and see. But the funny thing is, even your physical experiences at times betray you. So that's not something that you can fully rely upon. All right, so let's look at uh, 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter. Christianity has no doubt evidence 
And uh, there are several examples. One is obvious, which is obvious, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's had hands down. There's no way you can go around that one. Uh, Christianity has evidence because of the, the Bible in your hands. I mean, no other text or manuscript has much, as, has much manuscript evidence than your Bible. If you get 99.9%, that is huge, all right? If you're atheist just for that 0.1%, you're stark raven mad. Because even with your scientific evidence, you get a 0.1% off there. That's why you don't call it evidence. You just call it hypothesis or theory because you're open for that 0.1%. Christianity, there's no doubt strong evidence. Tangible evidence because if you studied uh, creation all around you, you see intelligent design behind everything. There's no way, there is no materialistic explanation for everything that goes around in our world. But empiricism, strong empiricism shows every single time that when there is intelligent design, the substance or something can be formed. It can become that way. But left by itself, you always uh, leave, leave yourself into problems. Even scientists are evidence themselves of intelligent design if they want to prove an evolutionary theory. They need to have intelligent design. They need to have a lot of PhDs to be able to do what they do. See, so intelligent design screams a lot. When you go it with comparing, as I've taught you in advanced discipleship, inference to the best explanation, when you combine that and then look at DNA and you look at uh, the origin of the universe as well as the fine tune of everything in our uh, creation, I mean, intelligent design fits with this empirical scientific tool called inference to the best explanation. And that is intelligent design. We don't even have, forget God, forget Christian God, forget a person, all right? But there is no doubt it is intelligent design there. That's what we come down to. More complex information, according to uh, mathematics scholar William Dembski, more complex information is put in. You can say chance, you can say random, but as the information becomes more complex, it has to be intelligent design, he says, when you compare mathematically all the workings around you. Same thing with common sense in life, with uh, your five senses of experience through empiricism. So we see right here things that are tangible, things that consist of evidence when it comes to our Christian faith. And all of this is what? Logical. It's reasonable. Logical and reasonable. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Notice in verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So that faith which is things hoped for, it is reasonable. See that? That's what the author said. All right, let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, and I will wrap it up here, all right? I will give the deep doctrine, all right? Because I drew, I, I, I worked so hard to draw this, it'd be lame if I just erased it, okay? So let me wrap it up here. Verse 2, for by it the elders obtained a good report. So in other words, our forefathers, that's the idea, the, the older people, because of faith, they were able to have a good testimony, a good report of it. So he's going to give a lot of examples here that we're going to see. Verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So notice right here, in faith, we realize that the worlds around us, that they've been made, shaped, framed, created, designed by what? God's Notice right here, word. Not just God, but his very own word. So that things which are seen, so in other words, everything that we see in our world through our five senses, physical, were not, a, were not made of things which do appear. In other words, there are other things that, we, that are not appearable, that we can't see, that created the things that we do see. And you want to hear something shocking? This is empirical, scientific statements that scientists have uh, realized. Yeah. This ain't Christianity here, all right? But Christians were way earlier, all right? 
So the reason why is cosmologists and physicists, especially those who get to theoretical physics, they start to realize that because they're trying to get into the origins of the universe. So the idea is this. Go to John 1. John 1. So God's word, the scripture demands, created the whole universe, right? Not just God, I said his word. Go to John 1. In here, we believe, according to Genesis 1, and that's evidential too, notice that whenever God speaks, it was created, right? So it's by his word. So when God gave his word, he spoke, that's what created, the verse said, worlds, whatever that means, okay? So let's, uh, let's, for now, see that this is the worlds that God created, or the universe, right? Soon as God spoke, this is our world that you and I live in. That's why church age saints, tribulation saints, live in this kind of world, all right? Remember I wrote right here, world, right? <laughs> so it is applicable right here. So God spoke and created all of this. However, uh, theor uh, scientists and physicists who were trying to find the origins of the universe, they were dabbling with string theory. And in string theory, there is no hard scientific proof. But it's so funny how many scientists who are for empiricism, they would resort to that and they would propose to that because that seems more, uh, that seems more rational than God, which is so funny. Because they realize that as you go back, you can't just say Big Bang. Big Bang came from something. And then that something came from something. And that something came from something. All right? Whatever the first substance is, it can't go on for eternity. Unless you want to say God, then they're in trouble. See? So that's the reason why scientists, uh, they have to keep going back. So they insist that all of the physical universe that we live in are made up from these subatomic particles, they call it, or quantum, or quanta. So they quantize things, so to speak, which is true. But then when you go back from the quanta, especially when you look into uh, gravity itself, they find out that it's composed of strings when you go even uh, further back. Vibrating strings. See that? Which is very, very interesting. So those scientists, what they're reaching into, what the Bible already told you, those vibrating strings or whatever, see, God's word spoke the world into existence. There's your strings right there. So God, he can just simply speak it out and then Here's the interesting thing. It's all instantaneous, we Christians believe. But in this instantaneous act, do you realize what, what you're studying behind that? In that instantaneous act, it composed of so many complex information, rich elements, fine-tuned stuff that baffles the mind of scientists. So then, this, let's go back to the quanta, right? Which goes back from the word, the strings. If quantum cosmology is true, and quantum cosmology, what that is, is actually, believe it or not, it's a fairy tale, all right? But this seems the most reasonable to atheists because they have no other explanation to how our universe is formed. So they claim that the Big Bang, it came from these, it came from the realm of quanta because the reason why is Big Bang is obviously not forever. All elements in our current universe is not forever because they all come from a singularity. So BGV theorem and everything that supports that. Stephen Hawking even realizes this. In other words, everything in our world goes back to a beginning. It's not forever. Even gravity itself, which Stephen Hawking tried to use. So a singularity is what went out like that. See that? But notice something similar here. See that? That's what I argue right there. What I argue right here is God just went, ah, and that's the singularity, and bam, it went out like that. But within the singularity, when scientists are studying what's inside here, what, uh, what made it happen, then they go further back into the quantum realm. So as they go back to a quantum realm, they believe that gravity can be quantitized, so to speak. There's a quantum gravity, quantum particles that goes behind the singularity. So uh, in quantum cosmology, they believe this quanta form exists, and then they have what they have here, a universal wave function. For this universal wave function, if this was activated, then what happens is that quantum 
uh, that quanta particles, once it's activated by this universal wave function, then you can get your singularity and then everything forming from the universe. But the funny thing is that what they say how you uh, activate this universal wave function is by two things. The funny thing is, one, somebody's got to be there to see it. All right, so they don't want to say that. So then they say you have to have a large macroscopic object that interacted with it because they don't want to say a person was there before then, right, or some being. So they say oh, you have to have some in encounter with a large macroscopic object. Well, that's funny. Doesn't God fill up heaven and earth and the whole universe? There's your large macroscopic object. So believe it or not, it actually supports more of what we believe in, that there is a God. So that's very interesting. So... If this is true, but actually it's all fantasy because they cannot prove it. Even Lawrence Krauss, the famous atheist physicist, was mourning, I don't think we'll ever uh, find evidence for that one because we're stuck, see, in our current universe. We can't go enter this realm. So what these atheists are trying to do is this. They know they can't go back. There, there cannot be a substance that goes on for eternity doing nothing. They know that. So, in other, so that's why they believe that there are so many worlds that happen endlessly. So that's, quantum, that's the quantum realm here. So they believe it's possible that there are so many different worlds out there. Now the funny thing is this, is that notice that the Bible says that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. I'm basically saying two things. One is I don't believe in quantum cosmology. But what I believe is that what, when God spoke the worlds into existence, when he was speaking, the, here's the funny thing, all right? So here's the interesting thing. I'll try to make it as easy as I can. Calvinists know that God has foreknowledge, right? So in other words, he knows every possible scenario and every choice what people will make. So they believe that Calvinists believe that so God has to predestinate it, make it that way. No, that, that, that's a dumb thing to say. God, he knows every choice that you make. So the funny thing is this. Look at how many different worlds then, mm -hmm. yeah. different choices and stuff like that, that God can already foreknow. Yeah. So what I th think is this way, is that instead of calling this quantum cosmology, I see this as foreknowledge. So God, in his foreknowledge, when he spoke the world to existence, at the same time, this thing that scientists perceive it to be is quanta is actually simultaneously going on that same time under our world. But to be quite honest, this is all under, interestingly, we can put this as God's foreknowledge. Yeah. That's intensely interesting right there. So this will debunk Calvinism. This will actually show the interesting side uh, to empirical science that they've always tried to dabble into, but also that the Bible has been way ahead of them. Amen. Way, way ahead of them. So this is all interesting stuff. I hope you got a blessing out of that one. The last thing I want to say is this. The Bible says that everything, was made, everything that we do see is made by things which do not appear, right? Quanta are particles that you cannot see. Those are those invisible parts. How about that? So when God spoke it, quanta particles or whatever they are could be undergoing that as he, bam, spoke the world into existence. And that foreknowledge is also already going underway when God spoke the world into existence. So that's the amazing thing. But anyway, this is just such a rough, uh, uh, rough shoddy uh, explanation of it. Uh, I think there's just uh, too many holes into it the way that I explain it, but I can see that this is getting onto something here. So I, there is no doubt that the explanations I get, gave to you, it's getting onto something. We just need to uh, delve into that even more, whoever can do that, and then expound this more accurately. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and made us appreciate your word more. Uh, help us to get home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.